Okay, so when you think about sex, and the reason we're here is to talk about sex writing, um, saucy scenes, you think, I think that it's private and that your body is separated out from, for example, what's happening at the government right now or what's happening on television or what's happening in a church somewhere and that you are totally in control and have the jurisdiction over your own physicality and that in a sense you're an animal in that moment who has total freedom of expression and that your awakening is clear and that you're really with like the whole of yourself. And this is sort of, we're gonna get to the point slowly today, um, but I'm sort of challenging that idea that we have control over our bodies um, as our bodies and our minds are conditioned by the state in, with, in which we live. And it comes from communities, it comes from religious backgrounds, all of our conditioning. So we're going to just look for a second at what that means and how that comes into play when people are writing sex scenes in famous books or in movies. Um, we're not a single sex scene that you've ever read or witnessed is separate from what it's trying to convey about race, class, um, social dynamics, um, money, interpersonal relations, gender, et cetera, power dynamics, all those things are playing out in the scenes that you witness. Um, so the first thing I wanna do just to get into the mind space is if you could just write down, f let's see, four things for me. First, I want you to write down three scenes you remember, like sex scenes, from movies or books. And then I also want you to write down the first time you learned about sex and where. Are we turning these in? Nobody has to see it. This is private, unless you want to share it with your friends at dinner. OK? So you're writing down three scenes you remember from a movie or a book that have to do with sex and sexuality or touching. That's erotic touch. And then one memory of the very first place you learned about your sexuality, whether it be a friend, a family member, school, TV, porn, whatever it was. Don't think, just, just feel. You can do it. Like for example, Basic Instinct, that scene with Sharon Stone that everyone always remembers, doesn't have to be very interesting, just whatever comes up. The lotion scene in Silence of the Lambs, creepy. <laughs> that is sexual. And then the first place you learned. I guess when you're done, look up at me and drop your pen. Give yourself a little pat on the back. Doing your assignment. <coughs> okay, you have about another minute to finish. So we can keep moving on. Wherever you are, you can stop. Um, if you're comfortable, raise your hand and tell me a movie or a book scene that you recall. If anyone has one that they're comfortable sharing. Yeah. Swept away. Lena what, what is swept away? I don't know it. Um, Lena Bergmall was the director. And, um, it has a nice scene. Yeah. Were the, so can you just like run through your head real quick? What were the gender of the people on the scene? Male and female. 
And what was the race of the people on the scene? Um, Italian. White people, Italian white people. And was there a power dynamic in the scene? Mm -hmm. In a class dynamic in the scene? Yes. Okay, awesome. Another person. Yeah. Um, a podcast called Audio Smut, and it's a person and a robot, and there's definitely a power dynamic. So a person and a robot and Audio Smut. Right. Guys, listen to your friends. So you know, listen to your friends. We don't know if the robot was white, you just know the voice. So that's great. So that's a, that's a great alternate venue. We're not used to hearing things about robots and people and on the radio. So that's a good one. We're going to pause yours for a second. That's actually a nice example of alternative uh, media, which is great. You had one. Mm hmm. Mm. Oh, interesting. So there's like the dichotomy or even maybe the blending of animal and human, mm -hmm. um, which isn't so most scenes we see ourselves as separate or raised above and then whether or not we are at the same level or, or not, et cetera, animal or human, separate. Done with that thought. Um, any others you want to bring up? Yes. I remember being very young and uh, watching MTV with my uh, dad's girlfriend's uh, daughter who was like a few years older than me. And there was the Madonna video for, I didn't know we could talk about sex. And I like, maybe I'd never even heard the word before. And she's like in, you know, leather and high heels and kind of whip. Right, so there's a power dynamic. And her color is? White. She's a white woman with a whip in a powerful position. Awesome. Okay, those are great examples just to like get our heads jogging in the direction. Anybody feel comfortable sharing where they first learned about sex? Cool. So I will start speaking about it. Um, the audiences that I often speak to are religious audiences, and some of them learn about it in the church or the synagogue, but mostly they don't. Um, so there's just like one example. People learn about sex from a friend on their block. They learn about it from a billboard. They learn about it from television. They learn about it from movies. I remember watching that terrible movie about, I think it was Jerry Lee, who's the guy from Great Balls of Fire with Winona Ryder? Jerry Lewis, right? Jerry Lee Lewis. Jerry Lee Lewis. That, for some reason, I still can remember that scene, and she was very young, and he was much older, and it was, like, like jarring to me. There's all, we've seen so much that we've taken in, and we're not always conscious of it. Um, and we, we see things at religious institutions. We see things, like, on this island there, you know, we're on the island of Martha's Vineyard, and there is a social ethic here and a code that we are, we're, we're rising to, or we're making sure that we don't go above or below and keeping ourselves in check because of the social code. So the question is, who's enforcing the social code? How is it being enforced? And what does it have to do with our private sexuality, which it, maybe, maybe it doesn't, right? Um, so these different factors of race, religion, money, et cetera, they play into the scenes that we witness. And the scenes that we witness in books and movies are actually, more than we realize, impacting us. And then those scenes that we witness are showing us what the narrative is supposed to look like. So if you want to drive a plot or you want to develop a character in a book or a movie and you want to put a sex scene in the middle of it, you're at, in that scene, you can render all different kinds of plot driving. You know, this whole class is supposed to be about like how we're going to write better scenes, but plot driving narratives that help it so that if if there's a power dynamic and we want to make something happen that's really um, like pressing, you can use that scene to as like a as a squeezing cauldron to create the next storm that comes. Um, the only reason that I'm getting at like the social influences and the factors is that we're looking right now that we're in a different time than we're used to. Um, we do have a new president-elect, and we do have a shifting cabinet and a shifting government where a lot of white men are in charge with a certain set of religious values that they want to speak of to the, to the masses. And we are all in shock a lot of the time, um, we being, I would say, liberal America, um, assuming my audience. And that, that shock that is coming is a little silly in a certain regard because that, that push has always been here. So that push of the government or a, a dominant religious mindset, like lacing and glazing over our, our psyche has been in this nation and it is what formed this nation. Um, Puritanism and Victorianism were the ideal and were the, sex, the sexual and social code and ethic that we like, erected our social culture out of. 
And so you could, re all of this is coming really from Foucault, the history of human sexuality. But this nation was founded on principles of in God we trust and ideas about country and men and different things. And religiosity wasn't the, the original code, but it comes in. So, so Puritan ethics, Christianity, European ideas that have to do with like whiteness and chastity and not having miscegenation, no interracial marriage, no like mixing of the blood. This idea that of like white supremacy that everyone's shocked has risen to the surface was here. It has been here. It's what founded a country that was based in slavery at a time that accepted it on the national scale until it, it all shifted. So the, my point being, our understanding about sexuality comes up and out of all of these different social movements that were shifting and moving throughout time. So feminism, we have another guest. Come on in, Milo. Uh, feminism in the 1960s, 70s, and what was happening with second wave feminism as well, a lot of those women were Jewish women who didn't ad adhere to the, the Victorian ethic and the Victorian code that had preceded them. So these are people that were willing to, to challenge the social norms and the social codes and bringing forth a repressed sexuality that had already, that had, they were bringing forth a sexuality that was there and a sexual mindset that had been there that had been repressed for many, many years within the national psyche. So we have these like grand sweeping national shifts so right now we're in the post period where we erupted the Puritan norm and we erupted the Victorian like thing that we thought was holding us back and tightening our neck and we created this culture of freedom where we are accepting to all kinds of sexualities where you know if you want to practice BDSM or you want to practice um, homosexual free love or you want to any kind of love that we have in this nation trans this that or the other it's our liberal national acceptable code is what we all thought as liberals. And it's not necessarily true that it was, it's not the national code, it's the corner code. It's the code of the people that were able to accept it. That white supremacist root that we're talking about had been here. So the reason I'm bringing all of this up is the factors in which our psyches are impacted as we act on our sexuality, these factors are really vital to be conscious of and aware of so that we know whether, are, are we free? Are we like self, Self, uh, what's the word, self-dictating, or are we ingesting things that were like poured over us, glossing us, and making us think that we are free in our bodies? And so this is the question when we look at these scenes, and I have a bunch that we're gonna look at, it's a question of how do we tell when we, like let's say tonight, all of us had like the most attractive partner in the world of whatever gender and whatever race and whatever anything, and we went home and we had the best, most exquisite sex of our lives, right? In those moments, how do we know that we weren't how, that, that it was exquisite? First of all, so like, there's that question: What's the litmus test? How do we know we're experiencing pleasure, right? How do we know that we've gotten to the peak of our own potential and our own experience, and and who's who's making that that potential, right? So if I were to watch music videos for a week straight of all different kinds, I might say, well, the more the people I sleep with, the more pleasure I've had. Or somebody else might give you a spiritual lesson and say, well, the more you've unified with nature, the more you've had. Even just this question of your own potential in terms of your pleasure or in terms of your understanding in a bedroom, this is coming, pouring in from other influences which are telling you what it is to expect and what it is to raise yourself as a standard physically, spiritually, intersocially, etc. So these all these questions. So the, the question is, how do we know where it comes from us and not from the outside? How do we know that a new administration isn't in bed with us when we go to bed at night? How do we know that we're not limiting our own expression and our own pleasure because we fear a repercussion and all these different questions? So, so that's something to just ask as we read these scenes and looking at the importance. And so this class was sort of, we sort of joked around when we made the title, it's, what is it, saucy, steam, saucy writing in the age of neo-Victorianism. But it's really a serious question of, well, how will you continue to write sex scenes if you're a writer? Like I know a bunch of writers who have said, I haven't written since he was elected. And it's not because they feel like he's holding their throat, but because their rights are threatened, their bodies are threatened, their expression of their sexuality as gay or as interracial or any kinds of things, or their, their trans body or any kind of thing that was otherwise being supported by their government wasn't. So some people just feel like they have no voice. And then the question is, well, who dictates your voice and who dictates your freedom of voice and your sexuality? And are we that much under the foot of, our, of a government, like is that how we work? Our, our psyches and our bodies are, we're, we're owned like that? So that's the question, how much are we being owned in our emotions and in our physicality right now? So talking fast and I'm making it up as I go, but I'm gonna just give you guys 
We're going to look at a few scenes, and then we're going to try to write one on our own without sharing, and we're going to talk a little more about these themes. Any questions? I go fast. I was going to say AIDS. Just I was going to say AIDS. Yeah, I was going to say AIDS. Um, <laughs> just in terms of your um, point about what shaped our sexuality, shapes and modifies right. our perception of what we do, and and it was that was a great external Truth. shaper right. of yeah. everyone's perception of human interaction. Right, and also of freedom of sexual expression. So I know like with, as AIDS was like, re like wreaking havoc, especially in San Francisco at the time, there was more demonstration of, well, this is what I like, this is what I will do because of a defiance of the disease taking over. So like the, the leather scene, for example, which I wrote for some reason tons about. Um, yeah. It was huge before AIDS. <laughs> right, but it got much bigger. It got much bigger and the, freedom, and the, the use of power dynamics and expression through those means became a really vital voice for healing, as I was taught. We, everything's subject to question. Yes. Um, yes? When speaking of the power dynamics in the wake of AIDS and the leather community, it reminds me, if, if I'm not terribly mistaken, please correct me if I am, of Michel Foucault, the uh, French philosopher who was a victim of AIDS and quite fond of uh, you know, yeah. leather activity. Right, we spoke of him at the beginning too. Oh, no, it's okay. Um, uh, ba -da -ba -doo. Yeah, they're all, I'm giving just like a, a rapid pace sort of like vomit of all the ideas that I could give in a moment. But there are infinite factors that shape the sexuality of a culture. So for example, I was saying we should have Kim Kardashian on the wall behind me as I'm speaking. And she's this emblem and everyone hates her and they have all these opinions about her, but she has, not she has, emblem. well, you're right. She has, I think she has like 68 million followers, which is absurd. It's an enormous amount of power. And she's, she's a vision of like bodies that were that curvy weren't actually celebrated in this country for a while. And she broke up a certain norm with this body that was like bedunk. And in addition, she's in an interracial couple. And so there's all kinds of things that she's, everybody hates on her, but she represents a certain element of like what we stand for right now sexually in this country and what we're willing to say is allowed and acceptable to a point, right? To like the point of Caitlyn Jenner being almost too much for people. There's, there's a, so, so she's like, it's almost like Kim Kardashian is the reaches of our acceptability. Um, but all of these emblems are shaping us at all times. So if I forget to say AIDS or if I forget to say, you know, which feminist here went aware, you know, if, if I say it was Jewish feminist, there was, you know, black feminism is really the origin of feminism in this country, like way, way, way back when. All these different feminisms, I'm, I have missing things. I'm only challenging that we question what's in our heads and what's in our bodies right now as we act like we're victims, when in fact the things that are victimizing us have been here and we have reason to be afraid and had reason to be afraid and we have also reason to feel very strong in owning ourselves right now. And so the question is when we come into our sexuality and own it, how much can we be pushed and moved by the state in that way? So let's just get into these scenes for a second. Um, so when we look at each of, let's just like skip around to one that, let's just start with, let's say Laughable Loves by Milan Kundera. So down, it's the second to last one on the first page. So the first question I want you to ask is, what's the race or background of the, of the writer? So who knows who Milan Kundera is? Anyone? Yeah? Um, Czech Hungarian. Okay. Um, white guy. Okay. So let, you want to read the scene out loud? No. Oh, you sure? <laughs> <laughs> I think you can handle it, right? I know all the words. I know here. You want me to read it? Okay. She had never undressed like this before. The shyness, the feeling of inner panic, the dizziness, all that she always had felt when undressing in front of the young man, and she couldn't hide in the darkness, all this was gone. She was standing in front of him, self-confident, insolent, bathed in light, and astonished at her sudden discovery of the gestures, heretofore unknown to her, of a slow, provocative striptease. So who's stripteasing? She is, right? Is it her or him? Her. Okay, so can someone just spell out any factor you hear in this? Is, what, what, do you, what are some of the words in here? The shyness, the inner panic, the dizziness. Okay, so there's an element of fear for, and excitement mixed together. But that's all gone. Off balance. Self-confident, insolent, bathed in light, astonished. Right, so there's, like an, there's a metamorphosis happening right before our eyes in two sentences, right? She goes from 
dizzy, she goes from nervous to like completely, it's almost like she becomes erect and she can stand in front of this man and show herself, right? So we have a power dynamic in this scene and we have a scene that is showing us, there's so much we can find and see within each of these scenes. So I'm assuming that you're all writers. I also know that you're not all writers, okay? So <laughs> if you were all writers, this is relevant to the, the scenes you're rendering, especially right now, that you ask questions of, am I empowering a female voice? Am I disempowering a female voice? Am I rendering a true scene? Am I rendering an untrue scene? Is there a purpose? Some writers don't think about those things and just go deep into a trance and bring forth what comes forth, and others craft things to like, create a direct point. So that's one of the questions. All right, so let's just go to another one. Um, let's try Middlesex by Jeffrey Eugenides. What is that book about? Anybody know? Um, yeah, it's about a, uh, I'm going to mess up my terminology. Intersex. Intersex um, person who is born with non, um, sort of medically unusual genitalia. I think with both sets of genitalia yeah. that we, we normally assign to one gender or the other, this person has all sets in their body. And they were assigned female at birth. Right. And then went through an interesting um, sort of. And is Jeffrey Eugenides intersex? To our knowledge? To our knowledge, he's, a, he's what we call a cisgendered man, which means he was born a man with the genitalia that he was assigned. Does that make sense? So cisgendered, mean, I'm not, I may be botching that up a little bit, but cisgendered basically means you're born the gender that you create or choose or, or embody later. With me? I saw a facial expression. Okay, so just important to know that. So this is a non-trans, I mean, intersex person rendering an intersex sexual scene, okay? So I turned the light off. I pressed against the object, capital O, notice that. I took the backs of her thighs in my hands, adjusting her legs around my waist. I reached under her. I brought her up to me, and then my body, like a cathedral, broke out into ringing. The hunchback in the belfry had jumped and was swinging madly on the rope. It's beautiful. So I'm going to read it again. I turned the light off. I pressed against the object. I took the backs of her thighs in my hands, adjusting her legs around my waist. I reached under her. I brought her up to me, and then my body, like a cathedral, broke out into ringing. The hunchback in the belfry had jumped and was swinging madly on the rope. Is this or is this not a liberation scene? It's amazing. So this is somebody who up till that point had a sexuality that was being not expressed in a, in a consensual way with others. Not to say that this person was inflicting themselves on others, but was probably up till then was alone and was also being demonized. So in this moment, not only does Jeffrey Eugenity say that it's, you know, this hunchback was swinging, but uses church metaphor to say, hey, look, my body not only is now sanctioned, my sexuality is now accepted, but I have become the, the cathedral itself. I am religiously sanctioned. I am not a sinner. I am not disgusting. I am not evil. I am not a creepy, decrepit man. I am going to swing from the rope. I am free. What an incredible scene. Okay, so that's what's just been rendered there. So in these simple scenes, we read them quickly and we're like, oh, sex, huh, fun. Oh, that's cool. Like, yeah, every animal has sex, except some of them don't. Some of them self procreate, and some of them. There's lots, actually, I'm wrong. Not every animal has sex. But, pro, but the sexuality of a human being is complex because it's not actually about procreation anymore. So if you read like biblical text, sex was often directed, and a lot of the laws are directed around making sure that the seed is planted. So people could, are, and I've just spent the week reading this incredible book called Sacred, Secre Sacred Secrets by Gershom Winkler. And it's all about, it's, it's Talmud and Torah about sexuality, but... Basically, A, everything we think that the Bible says, we're, all, we're mostly wrong. B, um, just trying to bring myself back to my point. I got really excited about the book and forgot what I was saying. Um, it's no procreated. Right, so a lot of the laws, in my interpretation, a lot of the origin laws that are in biblical texts have to do with making sure that a race was continued in a nomadic place where if, it, if the seed wasn't spread, then you might lose your tribe and you might lose your army. So if you're procreating, let's say, with the neighbor girl down the street who isn't of your tribe, then you have a problem because she'll make a baby and that baby will fight for the enemy. So there's just like one way of thinking about it. That is the most reductive uh, 
view of a very vast scope of looking at biblical law, but let's just think about that for a second. Let's just say, in a total fantasy world, that all of these rules are about procreation. We don't care right now in 2016 about whether we procreate every time we have sex for a thousand reasons. One, not all of us are having procreative sex. In other words, some of us are having sex with people that we can't procreate with. Some of us don't have procreative parts. Some of us, um, yeah, a lot of people I know, like I know one person who literally, they, they've made it so that their body, like there's vasectomies, there's hysterectomies, there's uh, someone else who, what's it called? When, I guess castration. All different kinds of things to do if you want, but, but willing castration, not like a, not a dehumanization version, but a choice to say, I don't want to have uh, like human producing semen left in me anymore. So all these different things. And then in addition, we have different systems in our time. Like if you think about Sarah in the Bible, who I think she was like 100 and, she had a 98 or 198 when she finally has a child. And when she finally has a child after waiting 198 years, she bursts out laughing and it's this like amazing scene where she's like, ha ha ha, because she gets super pregnant at the age of like 7,000. And so that's cute. But in our times, no one's going to wait 198 years because they're going to use like IVF or they're going to use a surrogate or they're going to use all different kinds of ways of, you could use adoption. There's just other ways of bringing your baby in. So procreation and sex don't have to match. Right? Like, and, and the imperative, like if we today, all of us were the only ones left on earth and we had a doctor there with IVF and we said we have to continue the race right now, we wouldn't have to all sleep together. We could get, the, we could get pregnant with the IVF. Even do it without each other. We could bring someone in from down the road. Freezing eggs. Freezing eggs. So there's, my point is simply saying, sex right now in our era is not dictated by procreation. It's dictated by a lot of other factors, but not all of us have ever sat down by ourselves and like taken a moment and asked, well, what is it? What am I driving with, with my urge? What am I driving with? Am I driving with my deepest desire to connect with another human being? Am I driving with the desire that I have the itch that if I don't scratch it, I'm gonna feel sick tomorrow? Am I driving with I'm anxious and I don't wanna feel anxious anymore? Am I driving with I wanna feel desired and I wanna feel seen? Am I, like, there's a thousand drives that come from a sex drive and they're complicated and they're important to recognize. One class I teach when I teach religious sexuality is where's God, like quote unquote God, we don't have to talk about God, I know it's, it's complicated, but where's God in the bedroom for people? And religious people, when you ask them that question, they realize, oh, I didn't bring, I didn't bring God into my body because I hate God right now, because God hates me because I love sex. And so all these different things have to be reconciled and we think, oh, our body's just a vehicle, but our body is where we store our whole history and where we store our whole culture. And I, like, you know, I grew up in a house with like dueling cultures in the house and I went to a Quaker school, but I was Jewish from two different backgrounds. My father not born in America. My like, the English wasn't the first language like, for him. There's like all these different other factors. I went to a Quaker school, to a Jewish synagogue, like lived in a Christian neighborhood for the most part. Like there were some Jews, but all my friends were very, very, very Catholic. So like, who's influencing my thoughts, right? Who's in charge? For me, I learned about sex because my sister told me and I didn't believe her. And then I read Our Bodies Ourselves, which is this Boston women's feminist collective book. And I would take the neighbors and I'd put them in my dad's office and I would read them this book and explain, well, here's how the feminists tell us that it's done. And I, so there's all these different factors that go into sexuality. And the only reason I'm, I'm again, harping on all these themes is that when you see a movie and you think you're not being influenced, you're wrong, right? Like we don't even think about how many heterosexual, white, normative sex scenes we've seen where like so-and-so's on top or so-and-so's been beaten or so-and-so's been raped on the screen. And we never question like, what was the race of this dynamic? What was the, was, was, like, are they, do they have the same amount of money? Do these two people, is there, a, is there a financial play in this? Is there a status play, a class play? Is there a religious play? Are they, you know, Romeo and Juliet defying their families or, you know, Kim Kardashian, if you look at, it's really interesting, if you look at, I just, this is so random, but Caitlyn Jenner's uh, Instagram feed recently, I noticed, by accident. Um, <laughs> uh, she has her family from her non-Kardashian side over for Thanksgiving this year. And they're all vanilla white. And they've all married vanilla white people and they have vanilla white babies. And then when you see the Kardashians get together for Thanksgiving, all of those girls, 
Um, they've, one chose a Jewish husband and the rest chose black partners and all of their babies are interracial Armenian black or Armenian Jewish children. And so it's interesting. So what was it about like this one group and this other group that pivots and why and what do we see? Like would the Kardashians have been as, like no one asked these questions. We just judge them. I'm obsessed with them because I think not just that, I might have a sickness because I really am, like when I'm sad or bored, I just look at all seven of their Instagram feeds and it like relaxes my nervous system. But on another level, they are the American family. Like think about like Kanye West and like, like Lamar Oda and these like basketball stars and like hip hop stars and then TV stars and it's endless. Like the Olympic father who became a mother and like it's endless. Like this is the American family that is so huge, at least for me. I just find them as the most important emblem. So just asking, what do we swallow, no pun intended, when we are watching, <laughs> when we're watching these scenes? on television and the movies? What are we swallowing when we look in, we watch like Roseanne, for example, for all of my childhood, or when we watch The Cosby Show, or when we watch Party of Five, or Sex and the City, like, think about Sex and the City, like how many people of color were on that show, like six probably in our whole time of watching, I mean, they had sex with like half of New York. And <laughs> so it's a question of, or, or how many of them had lesbian experiences? Was it like, what, I can remember one trans person on the show and it was a black transvestite who she screamed out from the street and made fun of. And it's like, there's all different kinds of things. So we don't know how we're being influenced. We think we choose our partners even. It's hilarious to think of that. Like, is it allowed for me to like think that you're beautiful in a way that made me want to go home with you by all the things that has influenced me? I'd have to, you have to fight through things and we could say, oh, we're so independent. We are what we are and we are going to like follow our heart, but it's not necessarily true. We are really influenced by the culture that holds us. And there's some brave people who are able to defy the culture or find a subculture to join, but it's hard to do. So, the, so we're, we're getting to our root of wh who are we? How do we get to that root in terms of who are we sexually? Who are we individually? How do we think for ourselves and how do we get to that? I don't know the answer yet. By the end, I will reveal. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, so let's go to another scene for a sec. Any other? You had a question. Did you want to ask it? Um, rewind. Um, we were um, talking about appropriation and necessity appropriation, which is so much of a. I mean, I'm about driving somebody, but the driver of uh, the tension of narrative right. is the. Uh, the inevitability or not of the potential inevitability of procreation right. and the, di the, the narrative tension. That's What's the narrative tension you're referencing, though? Which is the narrative? Uh, well, w whatever the narrative is oh, I see. and someone has sex, there is always the leading up to it and potentially after it, the question of, did you get pregnant? Interesting. In a, in a you know, in a, the most basic sort of you know, hetero right. model, which is 98% of everything right. out there. Right. So uh, by losing that changes the field quite a bit in driving a narr sexual narrative in anything because you know, there is, you know, it, and condoms don't often come up in a storyline. No. Um, can you think of any an scene option, you've ever seen? But if, if it did, it would be part of the narrative tension right. as to whether or not you know, that conversation suddenly becomes very... Right, and that's a really important point. Because also, if you think about, like, I just watched the show Insecure on HBO, which is this new show that just came out, and it's about... It's, people like say it's like Sex in the City and girls with black people in it. <laughs> and it's almost offensive to call it, to call it that, but it's a show about... Um, like three black, I guess two black female friends in, the, in Los Angeles and them just dealing with sexuality and dating and it's, it's just another show about dating but it's, the difference is it's the first show we've had on a major network like that that's about young black women looking at their sexuality. And it's I was just thinking about that show because it's like the last multiple sex scenes I've seen. <laughs> um, but they, there's, there isn't a mention of condoms. And most, like, on girls, I don't think I ever saw a condom. You see all kinds of funny sex scenes and crazy sex scenes. But they, and, and yet, it never would occur to me, ever, in almost any sex scene I've seen, did she get pregnant? Because it's not in the narrative anymore, I don't think. Pregnancy is not part of, like, it's, it's, not, it's not there. There's like a, 
I hear what you're saying. I'm just adding that we're in like a post-pregnant stage almost. And it's strange. And the fact that condoms aren't mentioned is weird. The only movie I can think of where there was an actual condom on the screen ever, well, probably there's probably a few more of like teenage movies that I'm not remembering, but Eight Mile, I, I think in Eight Mile, Eminem either did or didn't use a condom, and I remember noticing that. That's all I know. Anyways, yes. I'm getting my head turned into a knot. Uh, but do yes. the external forces with the shutting down of access to abortions and it's being kind of forced back into back alleys and, and is, is the changing in atmosphere that we are coming out of your, right. your post-Victorian right. story um, is like we're living it and it's changing and it's now. Right. It's almost like in a sense... The way I feel, at least, is like there's an element of we got out of our cage and someone just came and slapped us back in. And so what do we do with that? And I, th I think the reason, right, we have to write a lot of sex scenes. <laughs> and, uh, and I think the reason I find that so important is the limiting of our expression has already taken place. The limiting of expression is happening at all times right now because people's fear has gone up so high and we're feeding fear with each other. And it's dangerous and the fear is, va is, is valid and real and horrifying and dangerous. But, yes? Is the fear coming from, for lack of a better word, the breeder caste of people that more or less are committed to sex as a form of reproduction? Is it fear that they were, they're going to lose their, uh, some type of... Uh, a trademark on, on, on intercourse in general, specifically the threat to the American family. The, the right. Of, uh, well, so we have to also think about like how there's like this we. So I also just don't want to assume, I'm imagining like I have a vast live audience, but I don't, we're just recording it. Um, but the, this we is complicated, right? Because the liberal we that I know is a very shut-in community of people who weren't aware that there was another group of people who felt the same way they did for the past eight years, right? So just to be like, play devil's advocate, there's a victim group on the other side that feel that their values and their bodies have been threatened by the liberal rule. And so the fear, I think, is coming. I, don't, and I think that the taking, these people are taking back the night, right? They're taking back their own night. They're not actually trying to like victimize me. They're actually feeling like we were victims and we want you out. So that's complicated. But the fear I'm talking about, there's two kinds. One is a fact. There's been more violence, like exponentially more violence against people of color, uh, people who are LGBTQ community. There's just been a rampant increase in violence and often in the name of Trump, which is a problem. Because I don't think he actually means it to hurt people, but he's, people are being hurt. So that's a fact. People have been attacked and it's in, the, it's in the statistics, like exponentially more. But then there's also the fear of, what if I can't get birth control? The first thing that happened on my Facebook feed, amongst a thousand other things, the day after, was that people said, go right now and get an IUD. You get an IUD, you have birth control for eight years. It's like implanted inside of your uterus, and it controls your ability. Because so, people were afraid that they won't be able to access birth control. So there's fears coming of like, well, what is this going to affect? How is this going to affect my body? How is it going to affect? And then there's a separate, so there's real fear. And then there's the separate fear that's not real, which is the fear of a collective breathing on each other. And fear is contagious. Like, I remember when I spoke to um, Duncan, the, when you told me that like, Harry was on the water. Our friend sailed away the day after the election because the tides were right. And when you told me that, you were mad. And I left like, oh, like so scared. Like, oh my god, he's going to. Like, I was like, shaking and, and really like a wreck for two days. Like, He's just, he's just like random friend, not that important to me ultimately, but I was like heartbroken that he's going to be hurt. And then the next day I, I messaged Colleen, who's another friend of ours in this sailing community, and she's like, oh yeah, he's totally fine, it's going to be fine. And I don't know who's right, but both of, we don't know anything right now in the world. We don't know if it's going to be fine, but that fear, I was so scared, and then I was like, oh no, it's fine. Both of them are illogical, because I don't know. We don't know. But days out, he finally made it to Yeah, he's in the Bahamas. <laughs> but we're still worried. <laughs> um, <laughs> my point is simply that there's lots of fear happening and that what I'm here to talk about sex scenes, besides wanting like a podium to talk about what we're talking about, is that exercising your right to express your true voice and doing it at all times, and that could be in a page or it can be in your bed, saying, well, F this universe that's trying to take away, you know, if we all die tomorrow, it would be very sad if we all had bad sex before we died because we were busy worrying about somebody else dictating our bodies. You know, they can take away all of our rights, but they can't take away the, 
our right to love, which sounds so silly, but it's true. And it's funny because the night of the election, uh, the next day, I talked to two friends on the phone and they're like, what should we do? And I was like, go home and make love to your husband. Like, you have a partner at home? No question. You just touch every inch of his body and be grateful that God gave you someone that you're touching, period. It's so beautiful. Forget this stuff. Like, we connect to other human beings. And the way we do that is we connect to ourselves by pulling away all of the factors that are poisoning us into thinking we know what we know when we don't know. So that step one is to look at sex scenes from other books. We're going to look at another one. And just seeing what are the factors that we can be more conscious of every day. The more we're conscious, the more we know ourselves, the more we're not victims. Um, let's go to the second page, Tropic of Cancer by Henry Miller. Who knows who Henry Miller is? <laughs> yeah, Nate. Uh, he was an American writer who lived in France and was in California and was Do you know his religious background? Jewish? I think, is Henry Miller Jewish? I feel like he was. Uh, so he's a border jumper, so we have to know that. Every time we look at any book in life, we ask who's the author, any news source in life, for sure right now. We ask who's the author, what's the source, who's the publisher, what is this trying to, what, are we being prodded, or are we being manipulated, what's going on? So Henry Miller, question one, he's somebody who is able, we have to know that in his voice, to cruise cultures. He could be in France, he could be in California, not all of us have that, that privilege, right? Some people are in like Kentucky the entire time through. So he has a different vantage point. And he also, if he's banned, then he's not afraid. It's important that we know that. He's not afraid to say what he's not supposed to say. And so that means in some ways, for me, I trust his voice a tiny bit more. Because otherwise, because he's not owned. Unless he's just rebelling, which a lot of, a, rebel, a rebellion could be as bad as a, as a chain. There was something about her eloquence at that moment and the way she thrust that rose bush under my nose, which remains unforgettable. Her words imbued it with a peculiar fragrance. It was no longer just her private organ, but a treasure, a magic potent treasure, a God-given thing, and none the less so because she traded it day in and day out for a few pieces of silver. So who is he sleeping with? A prostitute. Oh, I wish I had my book with me. Did you know, side note, the ancient rabbis, many of them were with prostitutes a lot. I had no idea. And I'm learning a lot from this book about the prostitutes as teachers of spiritual lessons, which is fascinating. And I, yes? Is there any relationship that Harab is mentioning the temple of the, uh, the Ishtar, the goddess of the Babylonians, having prostitute priestess cast? Is there any relationship perhaps in Semitic mythology or, or, or greater studies that might link the early rabbinical studies of prostitution to that pagan practice? Yeah, probably. But I don't know the answer. That's cool. I'll just ask it. Yeah, that's great. Okay. But, okay, so we have, again, so first thing we have to check is, okay, he is positively imbuing the body parts of a person that we often think of as a low-grade human being, right? So check, step one, check your prostitution judgment, right? So, like, the, the way, one of the, the lessons with sex scene writing is, you, one of the things you could write, when, when we're going to all, in about a minute or two, try to write one on our own without sharing, um, but one thing you can do when you write a sex scene and that makes it really, really bad is you could say, like, it's sort of like, okay, he touched her here, and you're trying to think about the audience. So the whole time I'd be like, well, what does Leah want to hear? Does Leah want this? Does she want this? And like, how does it supposed to be? And, and, I, and it's, there's no experience. But as a writer, when you go into the experience, you feel the experience, and you break out of all, like, the practice of writing is literally it looks like this. You're just like letting go of all the social conditioning you possibly can. All of the, I told you what to say, I told you what to say, here's what your voice is, and you're like, shut up, I'm going to speak my truth. And that's the same thing with sex. It's like, move this way, move that way, and you say, no, I want it this way. And you're like, learn to figure out what your voice is and what your desire is, and it's very hard. We all think we know what we desire, we do not. We all think we've had good sex, we've only had as good as we've known. Every human being, it's the scariest thought to me, is capable of so much more pleasure than they've ever known in their entire life so far. None of us have reached our peak capacity with that. And it has to do with getting deeper and deeper in touch with ourselves and our own desires. And so here is a great scene where he's talking about her genitals. And in the book that I'm reading about Jewish, ancient Jewish sexual practices, there's a lot of talk about the genitals as forbidden or not forbidden. The female body part is mentioned or not mentioned. We don't get a lot of scenes talking about the aroma of the female genitalia. It's a big deal. 
So he is already with this scene. So you have to ask yourself, what am I seeing? Like, I, what's the movie, The Piano, where you see, what's his face? Forget his name, the actor. What? Harvey. Oh, yeah, Harvey Keitel, who I met in Vermont once. I love him. He speaks Yiddish. Um, anyway, so Harvey Keitel, you see, you see him full frontal. Okay, how many movies can you name on your hand where you've seen full frontal genitalia? We don't see it, but we're allowed to see people pummeling each other or screaming or having like crazy sex, but you won't see the genitalia. Or back in the day, you would see all these kissing scenes, but if you look closely, oftentimes they make it so the mouths aren't actually touching, so you'll never see the lips touch. So it's like, what in each culture is the threshold of acceptability? So here we have Henry Miller, Henry Miller breaking a boundary inside of his sex scene already. So he's telling us his political views. He's telling us who he's accepting and who he's not. He's telling us what boundaries he's going to break. So in a sex scene, you can, see, you can use sex as a litmus test for everything. As a litmus test for, especially in movies and TV, it's like, what are they trying to tell me? Like all the scenes that I'm remembering right now from from Insecure, from that show, there's just like so many, I mean, some of them are mediocre, but like the really awesome sex scenes where we're supposed to be like, wow, is a man just like pummeling a woman she, and she's down. And so that's great, but that's not what I'm used to seeing, I'm not used to seeing that. And it's an interesting thing as like the empowering sex scene. And then it also makes me question what in the community that they're rendering is different from my community. And you could just go crazy asking a thousand questions about race, class, culture, gender, and sex, and then also who is conveying what. Like, you ever watch the show The Mindy Project on Hulu? I think it's Hulu or Netflix, one of, those, one of those TV stations I once wanted to write a show for, and I went and looked at who their CEOs were because I decided I was sick of Hollywood when I was living there, and I didn't want to have to go through the agents. I was going to go to the top, and I was going to write, like, the CEO of, like, Hulu and say, I have a show for you. Let's bypass all the norms. And the show I wanted to sell was a show on Orthodox Jewish sexual practices. And I looked at who the, who the guys in charge were, and they were all right-wing Christians. And, if you, and so then, I didn't know that, and I was like, well, I'm not gonna try to sell them my show, although they honestly might be the only ones to buy it. Um, when I look closer, though, at the shows that they've chosen on the network, it was really concerning to me when I watched more closely that the themes are all abiding by those religious rules. They, they don't go too far out. And so I think I'm watching a transgressive feminist show about an Indian uh, OBGYN who's a single mom in New York, but in fact, it's really, 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 really poisonous and really, really dangerous, that show, and is convincing you of other things while you're watching it without even realizing it. But we don't know who the owner is and the other owner is. Or like a newspaper I wrote for recently, uh, I had an issue with the editor, and I was like, well, I'm gonna, I always want to go to the top. So I was like, I'm going to go to the top. I'm going to go to the owner of the paper, because that's who the editor's boss is. And when I looked who the editor's boss was, it's Trump's son-in-law. And so I just stopped there, because I couldn't go further. So just, we, ha we don't know who's driving us. And so, Henry, so when, we a when we read an author, we ask, like, who is, who's driving this scene? And what's going on here? And so um, let's do one more, and then I think we should write for a second. Anyone have any pauses or questions? Gary, perhaps right after that might have been something from Anais Nin. Yeah, know, she's amazing. Who's Anais Nin? Uh, his, I know um, who Anais Nin is. Tell us who Anais Nin is. Uh, Anais Nin is a French ingenue artist, writer, um, and was married to him. Yeah, and she, she's she famous for her Nin diaries. Like Silver Lake, like Silver Lake. Oh, yeah? Um, right near me. Yeah, wrote, a lot, and I, I know she, she right, known for her about diaries. She wrote diaries that are incredible. That, and it's also different because it's a female voice that's been documented intimately for many, 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 many years. And she was also in an era where, like, I'm almost, I get kind of, I can't read them because I get jealous because she's like, now I'm in Paris at this amazing apartment and everybody's here dressed like animals and we're having fun. And I'm like, what life did I not live? Um, but she's, she's incredible. And there's like 40 years of her diaries that you can read. So she's great. Anyways. Let's read one more, and then I think we're going to try to write for a few minutes, and then we'll talk, and then we'll go home and have good sex. So, with ourselves or others, it doesn't make a difference. Let's read, I don't want to read that one. Um, how about the Maps for Lost Lovers on the very bottom of the first page? Maps for Lost Lovers by Nadim Aslam. I don't know where she's from, but I don't, I don't think that she is, um, like, I don't think she's white. I'm going to assume that. Is that fair? The smell of his armpits was on her shoulders, a flower depositing pollen on a hummingbird's forehead. The smell of his armpits 
was on her shoulders, a flower depositing pollen on a hummingbird's forehead. They detonated the remains of each other's orgasms with fingers and tongues, areas of their bodies sticking together with sweat that was like the weak glue that holds segments of an orange together. So what we read in this is very different from, let's say, um, the Paris Hilton <coughs> uh, sex tape that was released, okay? What's the difference between those two things? Paris Hilton's sex tape had very little to do with her union with this world, right? So you don't have to believe in God, Jesus, or anything like that to believe in the possibility that like, you could come closer to nature when your body is coming closer to another body. So this scene is showing you a holy, quote-unquote, holy sex, where she's talking about such an appreciation that things like oranges and hummingbirds and flowers, the nuances of those things, like the pollen in a nose of a hummingbird that's so detailed, or the slice of an orange, suddenly the details of life become alive. So I think that that, that would be like one quote-unquote goal one might have if we want to overthrow the patriarchy, is that every single time you come into contact with your own sexuality or the sexuality of another, you are coming alive to the nuances of beauty and life in this world so that when you walk away, you don't feel shame, you don't feel dirty, you don't feel gross, you don't feel ugly, you don't feel embarrassed, but you and whoever it was or whether it was with yourself, it doesn't matter, that you go outside the next day and take a walk in Lambert's Cove and the trees are like alive for you. That you've just given yourself a gift of coming closer to aliveness because nobody's dead yet, you see? So that's, that's like... There's a point. All right, so let's just get out a pen and paper. And for a second, I want you to not write a whole scene, like so-and-so bent so-and-so over the forest, like, tree. And <laughs> but I, I would, I'd rather it be like the, the tiniest detail explained. explained. So you, it could, you can remember something you've experienced or you can render something fictionally. I think remembering is better. So it could be like the best, like I remember when I was 15, I went on this like 29 day like weird hiking expedition and the very last night the boy I liked the whole time hugged me and I think that was like the best sexual moment of my entire life because the hug was so, I could, it was like every fiber of my being was alive because I was so deeply entranced by his touch. And so that could be a sex scene right there. I could write, I could write how it felt to have his arms around me or how I lost the forest or whatever you want. But try to make it not cheesy and try to not make anybody swayed. Just stick with that tiniest feeling. It could be somebody touched your ear. It could be the look of an eye. It could be, it could be a moment of orgasm. I don't care. But I want it to be this like, thing that's real and that you blow it up quietly and slowly for the next like, five to seven minutes, 10 minutes, five minutes as long as I can be patient. Maybe just wrapping up in the next few minutes what you're working on. You can come back to it later tonight if you'd like. Maybe finishing the sentence you're working on. So this is an exercise. It sounds really silly, but when you watch the news and it starts to trigger you, or when more violence erupts, which it will, and you're freaked out, you can stop and spend five minutes writing 
about touching another human being. And it sounds so dumb, but that's the only thing you have eternal power over, no matter what the fuck happens, is to come back to yourself and your ability to love and touch. And so remembering that, exercising that is a really important practice because I learned from this lady about hearts closing and opening. And when your heart closes, you're in trouble. You're in a lot of trouble. And so that's, that's the exercise. That's like writing sex scenes in the face of neo-Victorianism is the question is how to, as we have that batting, like it really felt to me the day after the election the way I felt when I got hit in the face once in a while as a kid. It felt like, get the heck back there, you messed up. You were out of line, you wild liberal thing. Like sit in the corner and we'll walk. we're gonna wash your mouth out with soap. And you know what you do in the corner? You say, I'm wonderful, I'm wonderful, I'm wonderful, I'm wonderful. I love everybody around me. I love everyone around me. You are not going to, we, we just can't afford it. And, and the more we shut down ourselves, the more we are actually instruments of the state. And our job as human beings in a country where we may actually have a real problem coming, we might not. My uncle wants to think it's all gonna be great, okay? And if, if that's true, awesome, but there's a possible war coming. And so when that happens, our job whether we're scared or not, is, to, is to, to not shut down inside of our own hearts and our own bodies and to stay awake and to have great sex. Um, so the, my closing point, I'll just mention, when I teach these spiritual sexuality workshops, one of the things that comes up is um, somebody always gets upset and they're like, well, why are you talking about, we, we usually like deconstruct what God means and we deconstruct you know, what religious beliefs are put on us. And then you, somebody always says, well, why are you doing this? Like, I just want to use my body. I didn't want to have divine. Nobody, I, didn't, I never said I wanted divinity when I went to bed with someone. It doesn't matter what anybody else wants you to do. You can have sex with just your body and forget the flowers, the bees, and everything else and like do whatever you want. The guidelines of love and of connecting to things are only so that you don't feel more and more disconnected as time goes on. Some people like to feel that way and it's up to us. But the, the sort of like Kabbalistic teachings, which is like this mystical teachings in Judaism, they're really about unification between oneself, another, and a third entity, which is the divine. And if we talk about what that means to us in this era, it, for me on this island, it literally means, have I lost my ability to see a tree? Have I lost my ability to notice like what season we're in, whether a flower is blooming or dead? Have I lost my ability to see the ocean and let it like shut my head down and just look at it? When I have lost that ability, that's when I know I'm in trouble. Like when I cannot take a walk and notice what's around me, but I'm so busy in me, then that means the world is actually already dead. So that's, that's my litmus test. That's my attempt at keeping alive. And so I encourage you to read differently and witness differently and to ask more questions and to be profoundly uncomfortable and then to go home and have really good sex with yourself or your partner or your Tinder date. Good night.